The newest and truest cliche is that 10 years of innovation have been crammed into 10 months. It's the great acceleration point for B2B. So, so what's happened? Um, what needs to be done? Uh, what's the future look like? I mean, fortunately, we have an A-list panel with us today um, who's going to fill us in um, and give us some inspiration. So with me today, I have James Cannings, who's co-founder of MMT Digital. Hi, James. Welcome. Hello. Nice to be here. We have Deb Debbie Vivangus, who's global head of IBM Garage. Hey. Glad to have you. And then we have Mark Keating, who's chief innovation officer at Stein IAS. Hi, everyone. Welcome, Mark. So let's talk acceleration. I mean, I'm going to throw this out to the group. I think Debbie, you might you might chime in first. But what's the area that you think has moved the fastest? That if I if we were having this chat in February and I said you're not going to believe what happened, you know, before even Halloween in, in the U.S. here, uh, you know, what would that surprise thing be? What is what is really accelerated in your opinion? So so for me, I think you know you you said at the beginning, right? Ten months, yeah, ten years in ten months. And when, when COVID first started and we were a couple of months in, we were talking about two years in two months. So, so the, that kind of exponential acceleration we're continuing to see. And, and you know, born from a need, born from a necessity, born from a desperate desire to not lose your business from underneath your, your feet as you go. And what it is really accelerated is, is that full shift to digital transformation, that embracing of platforms, of integrated data sets, of understanding the entire human experience all the way through, of collaborative tools that enable teams to connect around the world. All of these broad elements of digital transformation, those foundational pillars, all of them have accelerated, right? Companies embracing new ways of working, companies embracing new platforms, uh, working out how they're gonna integrate their data sets. All of these have made huge leaps. And, and you know, we can't, we can't miss the huge leap that then also has to happen in terms of moving to the moving to the cloud and making those decisions about where to make those bets. These things have all made enormous steps forward in the last 10 months and, and they're continuing to do so. And they're the foundational elements that have to be done to allow some of the subsequent things. Yeah, it's remarkable. It's, it's certainly exciting times. Um, so James, you know, uh, to, to piggyback on that, you know, what are some things you've seen just kind of hyperspeed well, I think, I mean, I, I you know, I'd, I'd reflect all of that. I mean, I think it was amazing. I think, you know, that the first two weeks, I think all businesses, ours included, was that kind of rabbits in a headlight, what on earth is going on? I was super impressed with how, you know, we were a modern digital agency, right? So we were all kind of used to working remotely, but really kind of impressed with how quickly, you know, you know, our own business, but our clients kind of kind of got back up to speed and tried to get back to a sense of normality. We all sort of went, thank goodness this didn't happen 10 years ago. You know, I think, you know, you look at kind of just even remote working and our ability to do that um, would have been in a lot of trouble. But, you know, just to build on what Debbie said as well, I think what's been interesting is that the companies that have invested that or invested in that really quickly, I think the, the other thing was faced with the things that Debbie talked about, um, uncertainty and trying to save your business is just how quickly people were able to come together and make those kind of fast business decisions. So a lot of the times companies we see have the things in place that Debbie's talked about, maybe they have invested in some of those things. But so they have this kind of agile capability from a technical point of view, but the organization hasn't shaped around it. And I think a you know massive kind of learning from this will be, you know, how on it, there'll be people watching this and people will be able to relate to this where things just happened in a few weeks that they can say, geez, that would have taken us all year in 2019. And and maybe the risk and the governance was a little bit kind of crazy and we we don't want to kind of continue at that pace, but surely we can, you know, in 2021 think about how we can spring back to to making decisions in one or two months instead of you know those things that would take years. So I think it's it's all the things that Debbie said, um, absolutely. You know, plus some of that kind of you know those those lean, rapid decision making frameworks that that probably came together very quickly to just get get stuff done because because they had to. Yeah, right. And I, and I I would definitely build on that to say that the, the, I think the key is the data, right? The connecting the data to allow all those things to happen. And I think you've seen a massive acceleration that allows those things. So so and the reason I say that in to support of your point is that people are getting companies and enterprises are getting much more comfortable 
with that idea of setting a measurement of success, defining what that is and making decisions swiftly and quickly off the back of those measurements being met rather than, you know, needing a endless governance chain of 4,000 people to make the decision that they get, you know, they're moving in that mindset. Mm. I think that's a good point on the data and the data and agility, because that's kind of what we saw with a lot of our clients, you know, as soon as COVID kicked in and they had to start to make, you know, instant decisions, they had to respond to it. And a lot of them didn't have the data and the intelligence to make those decisions. So it's, you know, do, do we pause campaigns? Do we change our marketing message? Do we need to go to market with a different message that's got more empathy kind of built into it? Um, you know, what are our competitors doing? Are they spending more? Are they spending less? Are they pausing their campaigns? Um, so I think without that data and agility within the business to be able to make those decisions, then um, yeah, that, that was a challenge. And you know, in, t- in terms of what we've kind of seen, that's kind of gone full circle now, and that's become an instant priority. With a lot of our clients that were tracking that, um, you know, exactly how do you, how do you get better real time insights into the market? How do you re- react to it? Um, how does that change the type of communication that you, know, that you put out there as well? And also, what infrastructure? Do you need to deliver that? So again, you know, the, the, the pipes that deliver the right data and the right technology to kind of underpin that. So, so yeah, I think agility has come out of um, COVID as probably one of the biggest strategic areas to look at how, how do you take your business in a different direction using agility and a change of mindset at the heart of it. Really. Yeah. I think, the, I think the other big shift we've seen as well is the role of the, employee the employee experience and their engagement in the in the digital transformation and the processes that are involved right and i think you know there is a clear and proven connection between employee experience and customer experience you have happy employees they deliver better products and you get better customer experiences and you know all of these good things right it's well known but it's very often that we fail to give them the same focus internally as we do externally and i think that employee experience that employee engagement in new platforms and new ways of working use of data I think that you know all of those things enable that those employees to engage in the change that's happening around them much more easily and and therefore it becomes a change they're part of which means it's a change that sticks rather than flies by yeah I think we covered a lot of ground there I mean uh, agility is certainly a buzzy buzzword and I think it has to be because you know we've, we've all learned we've all made it a part of our lives um so what are a couple of things that you're seeing companies do that are, that are so impressive from an internal standpoint? I think we've touched upon it and kind of skimmed along the surface, but you know, um, you know, what are some of the things that, that, that you're impressed by and that you know, our, our folks at, at, that are watching uh, at home or wherever they may be um, can learn from? I mean, I think, you know, I guess we might be in danger of kind of banging this, make, make the same point. You're right, you know, agility is a buzzword. On the other hand, we're talking about, if we're, we're talking about you know, business agility, it's been talking around it for decades and decades. If we're talking about it in the context of digital engineering, you know, it's been around since the 50s. And, you know, it, you know so th- this isn't a, you know, a new buzz term. It's just taking a very long time to get there. So I think, you know, kind of go back to the point, I suppose in my world, you know, we are working with organizations who are getting more and more and more mature with, with the plumbing, with the technical capability. Yes, maybe they didn't have all the data plumbing in place and they, they move very quickly it's not so much the bit that i've been impressed with again it's slightly reiterating my other point it's it's being really impressed with these massive organizations who actually can suddenly get stuff done you know when, when we measure uh, agile maturity you know to give an example you know a really common one we see with some of the toolkits we use is that they have this uh, mature or a maturing capability around continuous deployment the, the business whether it's marketing it or the, the organization is able to now deploy more and more rapidly we can chuck stuff out to a live environment we've got really good at that over the last five years you know great some companies aren't, but some have been on that journey. Fantastic. When we actually measure speed to market, when we get underneath that and go, that's great. How good are you at actually getting, you know, allowing your staff to, or anyone in the organization to come up with like, great ideas and what is the ideation process? And, and then how quickly does that manifest itself onto a production environment into something you can A-B test? And typically that really sucks that scores really low really bad sentiment because that organization isn't isn't hasn't shifted around its 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 engineering capability 
Um, and so it, it's it's that it's been the most incredible experience of being able to go see. I, I knew you could do it <laughs> if you, if you if faced with impending doom. Um, and as I say, we, we just need to kind of remember that, not operate necessarily at that speed at that le level of risk. So it, it's less, I suppose, about the, the sort of the technical stuff. And there's been some brilliant examples, and more about the actually look we can all get people in a room on a remote call from all over the business and just make an executive fast decision and, and get stuff done um which is which has really impressed me yeah and um certainly we've seen that with our clients i mean so ibm garage is is all around you know accelerating that digital transformation from our clients and you know over the course of the last nine months since covid is set in we've gone from having about 300 garages to having about 2,000 garages with different clients around the world right it's just it, it, the, the acceleration in embracing design thinking led approaches, you know, user centric design all the way through, you know, value orchestration that's transparent and visible, underpinned by KPIs, delivered with agility, you know, all of these themes that come together are what we're seeing. And, and then you see them really come into play for, you know, major clients. And I think of, you know, organization, you know, I work with a major snack retailer in, in the US and, you know, overnight they realized that they had no direct channel to to end consumers right it was all through distribution networks and, and overnight suddenly everybody's locked down and they're potentially missing out on a huge market uh, and so we had you know a team already set up that was focused in one direction and just like that we changed the direction and went over there instead built them a whole new platform to direct sales which they get you know 10 million dollars a month of additional revenue coming through um, and you know and that's that kind of pivot that companies are doing to make the response to the changing needs that that that, that some of them are here to stay right mm. vw in april well you know were making it's a totally left field example but had 150 engineers you know in in i think it was spain based and they were working with a pharma company and we're just pumping out ventilators and stuff like that kind of you know incredible experiment that just shows wow look look you know a company the size of vw i think it was actually set within it who within weeks could do that kind of innovative pivot um it's just you know phenomenal you know to see this wasn't a little startup out of nowhere this was this was this big giant company and, and i'm sure there's lots of lovely examples you know yeah. like that one um so much great kind of learning and experimentation as, as an agilist it's a dream to kind of see it in in the context of you know being very mindful of whilst there are so many of these great examples and things to be positive about it's, it's in the context of um a lot of companies in some some very very you know difficult difficult situations um, who can't pivot in that way or, or, or you know just you know digital just you know it's, it's very very you know does, does just can't replace what's uh, what their core model is yeah i think the agility concept though has been very much in that i don't know d developer it kind of world for, for a long time and um but i think what we've seen in the marketing space is that you know agility is quite a new topic it's been quite a new concept and you know, marketers and brands have been used to kind of a lot of forward planning with their sort of campaign strategy. You know, we, we've talked now about, you know, the death of the big campaign, you know, and what COVID has taught marketers is that they've got to be, again, back to that agile kind of approach. They've got to be real, real time in their thinking. They've got to react to market trends a lot, a lot more quickly. And, um, you know, and, and ch changing how you approach your campaign strategy to be more nimble and have, you know, smaller campaigns, more targeted, uh, more agile in their approach, um, you, you know, but, uh, and also designing the systems that enable you to release those to market with speed. So developing things like campaign frameworks where you've got out of the box strategies, you've got out of the box frameworks and how you deliver you know, the right campaign at the right budget in the right channel to the right audiences and being able to replicate that at, at scale, you know, um, globally, locally, having that consistency in user experience that you get through that. So I think uh, yeah, that, that's going to be a, a big shift. I think marketers are going to have to sort of cope with and, and learn with this, you know, how, how do marketers become agile to align with the IT and the technical side of agility on the other side of the business? And not just agile, right? It, I, I think marketers need, you know, are increasingly becoming technologists, right? How do they use the data and you do some proper AI on it to get insights? How do they do localization based on what they're telling, you know, how do they, you know, use new bits of technology and, you know, and, and API driven open architectures to allow them to offer pop-up services almost, right? I mean, I think, I think 
the, the, the blend between skills that sit in IT or sit in marketing or sit in other parts of the business are all becoming a lot murkier because everybody needs to have them. And I mean, I think you're actually right. And I think what I, I did a talk recently on kind of on, on imposter syndrome, you know, what I wish I'd learned in my career. Right. And I, because I think, you know, when you talk about that, you're absolutely right. But at the same time, there might be people watching who for whom that's quite scary. Right. Because it's you know, that wasn't their world and you know, they didn't know anything about AI. And, all, and then, you know, there's you know, all the famous kind of MarTech diagrams of just how many platforms there are and they're exploding and it's an exponential I'm an ex-developer and I was always kind of in awe of developers who were much more talented than me and then that was you know there were just millions of routes my career could have gone and I think the you know it's overwhelming and we all have to put our hands up none of us have got the answers here it's completely overwhelming and and it, it the only way we're going to solve this is just kind of come together in those teams so you know it's that you know, I know it's a you know an old you know, issue of breaking down these silos, with, but marketing, digital, IT, whatever you call these functions, sales, you know, we'll have to come together to sort of help each other out because um, marketers aren't going to wake up tomorrow and be experts in AI and data and, and things like that. But they can, we can all come together and, you know, discuss these issues and, and find the experts within the organization and, and create these little high performing teams absolutely, you know, beyond the world of software engineering. Um, so, yeah. Uh, you know, I just want to sort of call, call that out because I think it, it, it's quite, you know, scary, this exponential curve that we're on for, for everyone, really. Yeah, and I, I love that, that point, um, the fact that you now have marketing, sales, and IT that kind of have to come together. Like, how, did, how does that happen? You know, people, we're humans. Humans don't necessarily, you know, work so great together when you put them in uncomfortable situations and roles they're not used to or they want to defend their turf and, you know, these things that happen. <laughs> how do you make it? How do you make it happen? I mean, we know it has to happen now because of, of everything we've discussed. But I don't know. What uh, Debbie? What do you think? Well, so you can't make it happen. You have to make them want it, right? And so it's all the things we've talked about. It's thinking about human centric design and thinking about them as the humans, right? So how? What is the change program? Who? Who is this for? Where? What is their role? You know, being able to articulate where you're going, the role they play in it. You know, the the, the things they have to do and making them understand that strategic vision. Because not only have you done that human centric design, but you've done that value orchestration and you've underpinned it by a set of measurements. And so you know, you can see what the path is. You can see where the strategic goals are. You can see how it's going to come together, and you can understand your part in it. So I think that's a critical part. In it. But I do think it's also about, you know, trying and doing, you know, that leadership, you know, the agility, especially in more regulated industries, whether it's in, you know, financial services or in public sector bodies, right, that, that, that need, it has to come from the top, that change, that, that leaning in has to be demonstrated, it can't just be words, we're all going to be agile, you, know, you have to actually be agile, or, you know, you actually have to do it, you have to walk the floors and demonstrate, because only by doing that do you empower and enable and give permission to the rest of the organization to get on board with the campaign. And so I think it's about, you know, reaching out for people to understand the role they play, which you can do through data, you can do through the design thinking and human centered approaches that we talked about. Uh, and then it's about, you know, them seeing it being supported from the top and then them being enabled by the right education as you, as you go along. That's a big right. answer to basically everything in there, but over, well, not pretty back it a bit further maybe. <laughs> Right. Well, I, I'd like to bring this to Mark. I mean, you know, we haven't talked a ton about marketing, you know, um, mm. obviously there's a ton of transformations that's happened here, happened here um, you know, especially because B2B was such a, it was kind of a, you know, an event driven, you know, see people face to face and, and you know, there were some kind of traditional tactics that kind of ruled the day um, that are no longer necessarily available. So what are you seeing from a marketing standpoint in terms of this acceleration point? Uh, I mean, I think, again, what, what I think COVID's kind of changed in, in a massive way is the relationship between sort of marketing and sales. So I think, you know, going, going back to that, um, you know, there was talk at the start of, year of this kind of H2 bloodbath where, you know, sales have got to kind of fill pipelines, there's a hole in the pipeline, and we're starting to see clients um, trying to shift more budget into demand-centric and demand-gen kind of programs, but at the same time without damaging, you know, the brand, the reputation and, um, you know, and, and still investing in that to sort of maintain that in market. Um, and I think it's about getting every stakeholder and every team within the business aligned against that customer experience. And I think, as Debbie said, it kind of starts from the top. You need 
kind of leaders at the top in the marketing function, the C-level, but also leaders at the top of the business to um, you know, make customer experience you know, a key priority, put it at the heart of the business and try and break down the silos across marketing, sales, uh, across demand and, and brand to kind of make that happen. Um, and I think that's still a huge challenge. And um, you know, even if you just take the demand side of it, you know, you've got marketing, you've got IT, you've got uh, inside sales, you've got field sales, you've got CRM, you've got website. And when you look at that customer experience, we're trying to create that frictionless journey from that first touch point through to being a customer and in life. But when you start to look underneath the journey and you see the realities of what's happening there, you know, you've got different data points, you know, some of the data's hand cranked, some of it is automated, you've got multiple platforms, platforms don't talk together. And I think until you visualize that, and define what the ideal customer experience looks like. You can't get the teams aligned and get them prioritized uh, against that. And at the end of the day, we're all kind of working to the same goal, which is if you improve the customer experience, you're going to improve growth, you're going to improve demand, you're going to improve you know, profitability. Um, and ultimately the customer is going to get value from it as, as well. So I think you know, mar marketing priorities are linked to how do we now sort of make that happen? Um, you know, what other technologies do we need to invest in? But at the same time, uh, without neglecting the technologies that we've already invested in, you know, websites, CRM, marketing automation, and, and how do we drive more value out of those, which at the moment, um, with a lot of clients are still underutilized and not um, delivering their full potential. And in, in a lot of cases, the, the, you know, the basic use cases to make them operational and, uh, and driving that value. Yeah, I know in, the marketing sorry, automation is, is going to change, right? That's the bit that will deepen and, and, and advance even further with technology, right? It'll, it'll take different shapes in terms of what is possible as the, as the data sets broaden and, and where you're able to drive those, those changes as a result, right? And the personalization, the intricacies of real time, I think you said, real time marketing, I think is, is a real challenge. And I think that that kind of automation in those processes will will help with a lot of that, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think, I mean, if we look at outside of the technology piece, I think that, you know, the biggest area where we're seeing innovation in kind of marketing strategy and campaign strategy is again, you know, putting that data and intelligence at the start of the process and you're know, using tools and technologies to understand you know, the pulse of the market, what topics and themes are being talked about in real time. And then how do you align your whole go-to-market strategy behind that. So how do you adjust your messaging? How do you adjust your creative, the tone of voice? How do you use the data that you've got from that kind of market pulse, if you like, to then find the accounts using predictive intent that are talking about those topics or showing a high level of intent against them? And then how do you use your ad tech to then deliver the right message, the right content at the right time to those accounts? And if you can connect that silver thread, the golden thread all the way through it, then you know, for me, that's kind of, um, you know, new, new campaign innovation, going back to those more agile campaign cycles. So, you know, um, you use data at the heart of it and, um, and do it in a more agile way with the right tech and the right data. Mm. Look, we're all saying the same thing. Must be yeah, right. I mean, actually, there was, all my observation was going to be just actually was fascinating listening to both of your answers because you're from both quite different worlds. But it, it kind of came back, you know, to, to the original question around how do you structure around this and in, in slightly different ways. But you kind of both said, well, it's, it's, it's about, you know, whether you're talking about value streams or customer journeys, which may or may not be a value stream, but there's a close alignment there. And it's, you know, you, it's the companies that have worked those out and then are really focused focus on that end-to-end -end journey and that inevitably leads to okay well who are all the people in these stages within the organization that need to drive this value stream or this journey right well let's you know let's get them owning that piece and empowered to own that piece um, and of course we'll have these departmental silos but it's the old sort of Peter Drucker efficacy over efficiency type thing we, we need efficiency in those departments but clearly and this is where tooling like good old slack and teams and facebook you know where we can kind of create those uh, as we've been using in engineering a lot you know create those cross-functional you know high performing teams across that across that value stream and and then yes then you can get into your martech and you can get into all those shiny exciting things that you know that's Mark's world and knows it very well. But if you if it's just marketing grabbing the latest shiny tool and doing it in there in in a silo, you know it'll only it'll just become another monolith, right? And we've spent the last decade, you know, solving a solving big companies' problems by putting in a massive monolithic platform at any point in the stack. Um, 
and now a lot of companies have en end up with a whole bunch of these things very brittly architected together um and, it, and it's very difficult so um yeah I, the observation was just that your your answers were were kind of i think similar listening to that it felt the same to me just using mm. Slightly different techie language. Yeah, so I thought I would just um, add to that by saying what you said a third time <laughs> to belabor the point. I hope not too badly. But there, there was, but there was, a, there was an interesting um, bit that, that you added, James, um, when you started, you know, kind of leaning in a little bit to culture um, and the culture of an organization and values of an organization and things like that. Um, you know, as we're in this transformational moment, it isn't, of course, just about the technology. It's about the this sort of glue that brings people together. So I think the question I have for the group is, how do you accelerate culture? And, and not just in terms of, you know, we're all in this together, but also how do you accel accelerate a culture that accepts the fact that we need to transform to do all the things we've talked about today and we need to keep transforming. You know, it's, uh, this is like where, I think if there's anything we've all learned is that there's, we're gonna keep moving forward. Like things are, the acceleration is gonna keep going. So. You know, how do you build a culture that's accepting of that and embraces that and makes things happen? So I'm gonna I'm gonna kick that to, to Mark um, first. Uh, I th well, I think I think back to you know what we did in our agency uh, going back about 10, 11 years now, where you know di digital technology was starting to you know really take off in a big way, digital channels, and we started to have you know Google and YouTube and social media started to come in. And, um, you know, we want to embrace transformation within our agency world to be, you know, a digital driven agency and utilize those tools. And, you know, we, we had um, a cultural program within the business, which was a year of digital, where, again, from, from the top down, you know, from literally from the top to the bottom, the bottom up and the top down, we defined what we wanted that to look like. And we made every person in the company take part in that. You know, we had them setting up social networks. We had them learning how to post information. We created task teams that had to learn about um, you know, the different dynamics of those. We got them involved in you know, posting things within um, diff different networks. Um, and, uh, and we actually created a social network internally within the business where people could kind of share their learning journey as well. And, and that was driven by you know, the, the passion of the business and the focus of the business to have to go in that direction, but to bring everyone, everyone along with us. So, you know, from the CEO down to the receptionist, everyone had a learning program and a plan, um, you know, to, uh, to embrace it. So we, so we embraced, we, we, we literally integrated it into the culture and made it a year long program and we incentivized people. Um, and I think, you know, at, at the end of that program, someone was awarded a trip to New York to go to the Web 2.0 conference. And, um, you know, so uh, and that person now works in my team um, and, he's a, and he's a great digital technologist um, through that learning kind of program. So I think it's, yeah, how, how, how do you um, how do you make it a business priority and how, how do you make the C-level drive it through to make it actually happen and do it in an engaging, fun way to bring people along with you? Debbie, before the call, you said that this was your favorite topic. So Well, so, so <laughs> why is it my favorite topic? So there are lots of studies about the value realized by the never ending sea of transformation and innovation programs, right? HBR will tell you, Harvard will tell you that, you know, our ability to realize impact of the business performance of a company has got worse over the last 20 years through transformation programs, not better, right? And, and a big part of that is, is this point, is this point on culture, right? Because if you don't address the culture as part of your transformation program, and therefore you don't think about how you're going to transform the individuals within a company, as well as transform the technology and the processes and the operational alignment and the organizational structure and the tools that people use. If you don't think about their wants and needs and behaviors, their individual fears, their motivations that make up the, the human beings that they are, and don't you find ways to engage them in the culture, in the change that is needed, then the, then the transformation program will fail. It, it just will not stick. And it will be in this pile of the 75% that fail to deliver meaningful impact to the business performance, right? So to be in that 25%, you must think about this culture. You must think about the individuals that are affected and you must think about engaging them. And that is the first step to being able to do it is to recognize that it is a role or a capacity or a capability that you must have as part of your program, that you must be thinking about the cultural engagement. You must be thinking about what does that look like here? How does it embed with the company values? How are you going to go from where you are to where you want them 
to be? What do you need to embody? What communication and community kind of programs can you kick off? And they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes as Mark's talked about, right? But the biggest step is to recognize that that cultural transformation is essential to the success, to the success of your business or marketing or other transformation. And when you get that in your head and therefore associate that and treat that like any one of the other streams, so you have data and technology and culture, then, then you are way more likely to be successful. Right. Yeah, and I, I wonder what, you know, in, in a sense, I mean, digital transformation, I think to a lot of us in it is a almost a daft term, right? We're all getting a bit sick of it. That's and I, I, I've been doing, what is it? I mean, I've been doing this for 21 years. I started my career making CD-ROMs and, and building e-learning platforms for schools, right? Which, was that not the digital transformation of, of the publishing sector and schools? I mean, it was, right? We just didn't call it that. Um, and I think maybe the difference now, one of the differences now, it's i.e., this is a never ending thing. We, you know, it's not a thing like, oh, we need to do a digital transformation and then whew, we've got that out of the way. Now we're okay, right? It, we've been doing it and we'll keep doing it and it's getting exponentially faster and harder and all, all those things. I, I think, you know, what, I completely agree with Debbie's points. And I think one of the things that we're kind of learning now is that we've maybe been guilty back to that kind of putting in these monolithic platforms of doing these huge, vast transformation programs that last 18 months, two years, three years, companies spending millions and millions and millions and sort of going, phew, you know, we've done that. And, and then it, you know, it spends a period of time being a bit brittle and getting bolted on in rather clumsy ways before they have to transform, throw the whole thing out or transform it in kind of a radical way. And I think it's the top down, bottom up cultural piece, but then, the, you know, the technology piece in the middle is about those much more fluid, flexible, SaaS based, you know, microservices is an overused term, but, but having, a, having a technology platform that supports this, you know, continuous delivery, and then, yes, absolutely, a, a culture then that gets its head round, you know, this kind of ongoing, uh, you know, fluid um, product mentality rather than just sort of jumping from these big enterprise programs one from one, one to the other. Um, so I, th I think that sort of feels a little bit different is that we've all probably can relate to the fact that we've been through a number of painful, expensive digital transformation projects, although you probably didn't call them that over the last decade. And, and it, it feels like there's a real move towards a more kind of iterative approach. Um, hence, I saw we're talking about top down support for agile, high performing teams aligned around value streams and technology platforms that enable that. And that feels different to when I was making CD-ROMs. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, we, we, we've raised a lot of good points here and it's certainly a broad topic and we can go in lots of different places, but just to put a real, really narrow, fine point on it for the folks who are watching right now, if there was one thing, you know, after they finished watching this and they click off that they should be thinking about or, or doing or implementing or being inspired by, um, you know, what would, that, what would that thought be? What would that action be? And I'm going to go to Debbie first. God, the hardest question he goes to me first. So if there's one thing, <laughs> I think it would be, you've got to really understand data at a different level, right? And so they need to go and understand what is the data architecture underneath the services they're trying to provide. Because when you can get that right, there are limitless possibilities as to where you can go when you can connect that data to, to the wider ecosystem. So I think my call to action for, for, for all those trying to drive those that kind of transformations is to is to kind of get into the data. Absolutely, James. What are your thoughts? Um, thoughts? I mean, I think there's been lots of wonderful points here, and I'll let people, you know, as I'm sure they won't, uh, rewatch the recordings and things like that. So I, I think I, I might, you know, crowbar my point in. My other hat is the the co-chair of the Beamer Sustainability Council, and what I'd love people to think of as we kind of drive in and get very excited about digital transformation uh, or the necessity of it is you know if we go back to 2008 um, you know pre that there was a lot of talk about sustainability and carbon footprint we've been aware of this for decades and it, and then we kind of had this huge global recession and we kind of lost the decade because it, did, it wasn't a priority anymore and I think that as as an industry we have to be aware of some of the, the scary numbers you know just just how big a producer of CO2 digital is the internet is there's lots and lots of you know scary stats we would be I think the sixth biggest producer if we were a country and that depends on how where and how you measure it um, 
What the world is missing right now is the web content accessibility guidelines for sustainability. Um, and actually there's lots we can do when we're designing creatively, when we're doing campaigns, when we're planning our um, digital transformation, when engineers are coding, when we're thinking about architecture, when we're thinking about data and where we're going to put it, we think about lots of things from cost and speed and accessibility, but we're not really talking about carbon footprint. Um, watch this space or, you know, we're going to try and get some stuff um, out there um, to sort of fill that gap, because I think it's going to be a while until the world does have the equivalent of the accessibility standards for sustainability. Um, but there's lots that you can do right now in terms of, you know, measuring that footprint that doesn't kind of increase cost and time in the same way that accessibility and building for accessibility actually has a lot of benefits in terms of you know, obviously making your stuff, you know, available to a broader set of users, but often it, you know, these things make it more searchable, faster. And the same is true for making a lightweight, low carbon web page or media ad or campaign. Um, and sorry, I'm waffling on and I don't want to sort of turn it into a big eco warrior rant, but the, the, I would, I, I, we just don't have another sort of decade to, to, to lose getting back on our feet, can't be back on our feet um, at all costs. So I, I'd love people to just start to think about that. Yeah, James, that's a super important point. And, and thank you for, for crowbarring it in there. Um, we probably should have gotten <laughs> to that a little bit earlier, but you know, we got it in there. So, uh, <laughs> so Mark, you know, uh, to put the, the bow on it and, and give us a, you know, a, a final thought to be thinking of? Uh, I think James talked about before, like, you know, the, the transformation journey that never ends now. You know, people used to think about it in you know, two, three year cycles, and, and even that was kind of long. And, and even though there's agility built into those cycles, I think now it's having that change of mindset that if you're gonna have an innovation driven culture, you've got to change your mindset. And I think it's about moving to more of a kind of war type mentality where you, you can't stop now you have to carry on you've got to get out the trenches you've got to continually innovate never stop and um or if you do you'll get caught out and i think you know covid's taught us that you can't be outsmarted by the competition and if you've not got your data strategy you've not got the agility you've got not got the right tech the right oper operational frameworks and you think with that new mindset you can get um, left out in a cult so i think it's um you know, have a mindset change but at the same time don't do too much, do, do, do things right, do a smaller number of things and, and focus on those and deliver the results before you move on to the next. And so that would be my, uh, my parting um, comment. Terrific. Well, I wanna, uh, I wanna thank the, the panel here today. Um, really great stuff. Um, I wanna thank everybody who's watching. Um, we hope you, um, you've gotten some insights and some inspiration from this session and um, stay safe everyone. <laughs>